Well, how would you like the name Thor? Doesn't that sound like a, like a, a really a guy's name, the name Thor? Well, it's not my name, but it was my great-grandfather's name, Thor Anderson. How about that? Thor and Christine Anderson, they were my grandparents, but I never knew them. They were born, they were raised and got married in Oslo, Norway, and for reasons that I'm not entirely aware of, they joined the multitudes of Europeans to leave their home and seek passage across the Atlantic Ocean and through Ellis Island, New York, find their new home in the United States of America. For my great-grandparents, Thor and Christine Anderson, that was the year 1898. Now, sadly, within a few months of arriving in the United States, they both were ill and died of a disease I'm not aware of, but not before giving birth to my grandfather, Victor George Anderson. Now, had they gotten sick earlier, that means, if they, meaning, if they got sick before they boarded that ocean liner for New York, they would have died, obviously, in Norway. And even if my grandfather had been born, he would have been born there and not here. Had he not been born in America, he never would have met Jenny Bankson of South Dakota, who he would later marry. Had he never met her, my father, Richard James Anderson, would never have been born. My father would later attend San Diego State, fall in love, and get engaged. But he had a change of heart and broke off his engagement. Had he not had a change of heart, he would have not decided to withdraw from San Diego State in a sophomore year, stick out his thumb, hitchhike across the United States, and enroll in Boston University. Had he not gone to Boston University, he would not have become aware of a camp called Brookwood's Camp in New Hampshire. Had he not become aware of Brookwood's Camp in New Hampshire for college students, he would not have attended that camp. And had he never attended that camp, he would not have met this petite but very athletic brunette in a pickup game of baseball who happened to hit a ground ball to his best friend, Buckley, playing shortstop. <laughs> not only did this little petite brunette outrun Buckley's throw to first base, Buckley's throw actually went over the first baseman's head, allowing this little athletic brunette to motor her little legs around the bases to what we know as an in-the-park home run thereby catching the attention of Richard James Anderson, who couldn't believe how fast she could run. Had that speedy little co-ed not gotten a hit that afternoon, or had my father's friend Buckley not thrown the ball over the first baseman's head, chances are she never would have met my father, fallen in love, and gotten married to him. And if that never happened, well, this world would have suffered a very great sadness, for without their marriage, there would never have been me. <laughs> according to the Bible, according to the Bible, honest, according to the Bible, human life, it's a story, and the author of the story is God Himself. And in God's story, He planned me even though my standing here today can appear to be the result of a string of chance encounters, random events, and spontaneous decisions. Nonetheless, He planned me. And the same can be said of you. You do not exist because on one day certain stars aligned and now there is a you. There is a you because God, the author of all story, but also the author of your story, wanted there to be a you. So aren't you glad? Yeah. Well, it begs the question, though, why? Or better said, what is it that God is really after? If He planned me, if He planned you, if He planned everyone that you see, what exactly is God's intention? What's He after? What's the reason for it all? Whether the subject is the grand story of mankind or your individual story or mine, what is the theme? What is the storyline? What is God after? Well, God is after people, if we know anything about the Bible. He's after people because it's people that matter most to God. And the storyline is whatever God has to do to rescue people. That's the storyline. And that is what we celebrate at Christmas, the storyline. We celebrate whatever it is that God has done, not just to make, but then to rescue the people that He planned. 
That is Christmas. That in Jesus Christ, love came down. Down to rescue, to retrieve for God what matters most to God. One way to look at God's grand story is to categorize the storyline with three words, each related to God. The first would be this, God's plan. God's plan. He had a plan. In a brief article entitled Maui Mangoes and Cabernet, John Eldridge has this to say about God's hand and his heart in creation. When the curtain goes up on the story of humanity, we see God in a flurry of breathtaking, dramatic actions that too often we blandly label as creation. Yosemite and Yellowstone and Maui and the Alps, mangoes and blackberries and Cabernet grapes, horses and hummingbirds and rainbow trout. God is the creator. God then creates man and woman and sets them in that paradise. Well, how long had he been planning this? Are we humans merely the replacement of the angels God lost when Satan rebelled? Are we the first date he can find on the rebound? Who, in fact, are we to him? Well, the first chapter of Ephesians gives a look into God's motives here. Long before he laid down the earth's foundations, he had us in mind. He had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. Oh, what pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift-giving by the hand of his beloved son. And long before we first heard of Christ and gotten our hopes up, God had his eyes on us. He had designs on us for glorious living. That the paraphrase of the first chapter of Ephesians by Eugene Peterson in the message. Well, you and I were not accidents. We were planned. We weren't surprise babies or surprise human beings to God. He had always had us in mind. We are the product, man is the product of the well thought out in advance deliberate plan of God. And we see that very clearly in the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1. Oh, and you think, Genesis 1, this is Christmas season. What are we going back to Genesis for? Oh, the Christmas theme is all throughout the Scriptures. And the Christmas theme opens up just as the Bible does in the book of Genesis. Genesis 1 says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that. And the so that does what? It tells you now they're going to show you intentionality and purpose. Why was man made in God's image? So that. For this reason, they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock, over all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. He created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. God saw all that he had made. It was very good. There was evening. There was morning. It was the sixth day. Now that sounds like a whim, doesn't it? That sounds like a spontaneous idea. Hey, but I got an idea. Let's create human beings. That's not what is implied or inferred or even clearly stated in Genesis 1. What we see clearly here is intentionality. Let's make him in our image so that he can rule. Let's tell them to increase and multiply. Why? Because God had plans. He wanted many human beings. It was planned. It was deliberate. Nothing about this sounds like God is acting on a whim. He makes everything, everything first, and then man is the last thing that he creates. It's his last, if you will, stroke of genius and imagination. Mankind is the capstone, it's the jewel on the top of everything else he put together. Matter of fact, everything else put together, he put together for man. So, God is a being in fellowship and so are we. However God is in the way he relates, we can see that when we look at each other. We live for connections, right? How many of you live to be a recluse? How many of you live to to separate yourself from others. No, we live inclined toward connectivity. Now, we're all fallen, so to some degree that connection can be fallen, and even our interest in being connected to people can be less than God designed us for. Why? Well, because we're fallen. But like it or not, at your core, you are a relational being because God is a relational being and He made you in His image. The divine and the human, the creator and the creature, as close as father-daughter, as close as father-son, that's the intention. 
And then he places us in a paradise, perfect physical surroundings into which he would then, then enjoy our company. His paradise needed no improving, no adjusting, no fine-tuning, and no repair. Man was innocent. He needed no repair either, without flaw. The Garden of Eden was perfect, as was the world beyond its borders. Imagine as best you can perfect peace. Imagine as best you can a serenity, a walking with God, enjoying God's company freely. Adam and Eve, no tension. (laughs) Imagine that. A man and a woman in marriage, no tension at all. Only joy all the time. Only pleasure all the time. Only laughter all the time. Wow, that is hard to imagine, isn't it? Maybe that's autobiographical, but anyways. My poor wife. So we see the obvious signs of the beauty of God's creation, but every day we also see the obvious signs of evil decay and the horror of what we should call paradise lost. So how do you mess up perfection? I mean, really? We already live in a fallen world, so when we sort of add to its fallenness, it's like, well, that's, t- that's typical, figure. But what about when you're in paradise? How do you mess up paradise? Really? I mean, way to go, Adam. It's really not that complicated, that is, to mess it up. I mean, God's org chart for the running of the universe is really pretty streamlined. There's God over everything, or you could say, here's God at the top. There's a direct line to Adam, and then under Adam and Eve is everything else. God over Adam, Adam and Eve over everything else. Pretty streamlined, pretty simple organizational chart, pretty easy to manage, Well, how do you mess it up? Well, Adam decides he likes the fact that he's over everything else, but he'd just like to be over everything, not just everything else. He'd like to be over God, or at least without God being over him. That's called self-governance. That's how you mess up paradise, and mess it up he did. The heart of all sin, yours, mine, and Adam and Eve's is the desire to do things our way. You can call it pride, you can call it independence, rebellion, it's all those things. But at the heart of it, it's I'd like to govern. I'd like to be the top of the org chart. What's, I'd like to be at the top. What's it like to be God? We do know a little bit about what it's like to be God. We do. If you've ever poured your heart your efforts, your passion into something, maybe plans for a business or plans for education or plans for a relationship, maybe pouring your heart into a relationship because you want to then pour your heart into marriage, maybe plans for family, plans for something else in life, plans for, well, just about anything that's important to you. If you've ever poured your heart into something that's important to you only to have someone else ruin your plans, then you know something of what it's like to be God. Just a little bit. I mean, I can jump on the stage up in the air a little bit, right? Did I just jump on the stage? Do you see the space between me? I can jump, right? But to call myself an astronaut, (laughs) that's a little bit of a stretch. But still, I know know a little bit about what it's to be in space, right? (laughs) I know a little bit. You know a little bit of what it's to be like God, what it's to be, what it's like to be Him, if anybody's ever ruined your plans. Christmas should remind us that God had an original plan, and Christmas should remind us that God then had a problem on his hands. And it's a big problem. And that's number two. He had a plan. Number two, he had a problem. He warned Adam and Eve, if you eat of the fruit, you're surely going to die. We won't have the relationship I created you for. Connectivity? Beings in fellowship? Well, I'll still be that way. You'll still be that way, but you won't be that way with me. That's what death is, separation from me. So God's judgment fell. You know the story, right? Banished from the Garden of Eden. No longer inhabited by God, but now inhabited by sin. The controlling principle of the indwelling Holy Spirit was no longer the controlling principle. And so by Genesis chapter 6, it says that all of mankind had become evil in all of its intentions and in all of its ways. So what happens? Pain increases. Men and women would no longer be partners but manipulators. God created man and women with equal value. But what happens? After the fall, they fight and they contend for control. They become manipulators, perpetuators of an endless cycle of selfishness. Self-worth is distorted. Adam and Eve, where are you? We're hiding. Why? We're naked. Why? Well, because we're naked. That's why. Well, why do you care? Where did that word come from anyway, Adam? 
When did you make up the word naked? There wasn't a word for it before. Well, yeah, but we're, we're ashamed. Why are you ashamed? Self-worth becomes distorted after the fall. Guilt, fear, insecurity become man's constant companions. Paul sums up our hopeless condition this way. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam sinned and brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. He goes on to say we become the, the enemy of God, therefore the direct object of God's wrath. Isn't this a great Christmas message? Nothing <laughs> great. Listen, Christmas is in the middle of all of this. God had a plan. Then God has a problem. Man runs from his plan. Ruins it, if you will. By our very nature, we then become subject to God's anger, just like everybody else. Now, God could have just tossed us aside his plan to be in constant fellowship with mankind. He could have just tossed that plan aside and us with it. But for reasons we will never fully be able to understand, and I believe this is true, for reasons we will never fully be able to understand, such a response is not the nature of God. He doesn't discard what he loves. He seeks to rescue it. To be God means to recover whatever has been lost, regardless of the personal cost. Christmas, Christmas, my friends, should remind us that God had an original plan. And though man created a problem for God, God then makes provision for it all. God has a solution, both the, the ability to solve the problem and the wanting to solve the problem. And that's what Christmas should remind us of. We have four children, and you probably know that. Our youngest is Delphina. She turns 11 later this week, so she's 10 still. This last Monday, I went to get her out of bed just like do all the kids. You know, wake up, come on. And I always start sort of, you know, gentle and quiet. I usually pinch her big toe if I can find it through the blankets at the end of her bed and say, Delphina, it's time to wake up. Well, then she rolls over. I think, this is going to be tough this morning. So I walk on, I start scratching her, and honey, come on, rise and shine, Monday new day. Come on, get up. Your teacher's counting on you. Let's go. And uh, all she does is give me her arm like this. So I pull her arm up and I get her up. I get her seated up in bed and I let go of the arm. What happens? Like boneless. She just whoop, falls back into the bed, right? Dad, I don't want to go. And honey, you have to. It's Monday at school. You got to go to school and your teacher, your friends, they're counting on you. You got to be there. No, I'm not going to go. Yeah, you got to. So I tempt her, right? because I'm a manipulator. So I said, how about some tea? And I offer her tea. No, 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 no. I, I, I even got her bagel with butter so she could smell the aroma of breakfast. Right? That wouldn't get out of her bed. So finally, I know my daughter. I did the one thing that always works. I offered her a piggyback ride from her bed in her jammies all the way down to the kitchen table. Sure enough, I got her downstairs. I coaxed her. I had to drag her. I had to carry her to get there. Friends, praise God. He needs no coaxing. You don't have to say to God, come on, God, rise and shine. There's a problem in the universe, and you got to fix it. Everybody's counting on you. Let's go. Come on. You want some bagel and butter? You want some tea? Come on, God. No coaxing is necessary. Because for reasons that I, like I said a moment ago, that I don't believe we will ever fully understand, the very nature of God is not to discard what he's created to be in relationship with him, but to go and retrieve it. And he's motivated to do so, self-motivated. We don't have to cajole. We don't have to manipulate or attempt to. God is willing to be the provision for the problem that man created. God had a plan. Because of man, God then had a problem. Because God is who God is, he then became the very solution, the provision to that problem. And we see this way back, as I mentioned earlier, in our Christmas book, Genesis. Chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Then God, the Lord God said to the serpent, now they've already sinned, right? And now he's going to mete out all of the, the retribution, all the consequences for it. He said, because you've done this, Satan, you are cursed more than all animals, speaking to the serpent, domestic and wild. You'll crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. Verse 15, and I, God, will cause hostility between you and the woman. And between your seed, your offspring, and her seed, or her offspring, he will strike your head, and you will strike 
his heel. This is, back in Genesis chapter 13, the very beginning of the Bible, the first reference, reference, the first nuance to Jesus Christ. It would be the seed of the woman who, though is wounded on his heel, crucifixion, he will, through the crucifixion, wound the serpent, Satan, on his head. A death blow. A death blow. This is the first reference to Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. So what is the rest of the Bible? I mean, could God have just stopped in Genesis chapter 3? Yes, he could have, but he has a story of mankind to, sh- to tell, and in telling of that story, to show us how he intervenes through the ages, first to protect the seed, to ensure that it comes to be, but also to protect his people along the way. And so the rest of the Bible is the story of God fixing his one and only problem, the loss of a relationship with mankind. The history of mankind is simply the story of God refusing to leave things the way Adam left them. The Bible is the story of God's relentless pursuit of man. The Bible is the story of love coming down. Once ushered out of the Garden of Eden, outside of fellowship with God and dependence upon him, man does what he pleases. So much so that when you come to Noah, God says, I'm done. He gets rid of everyone except for one family. Why? Because he promised that the seed would one day crush the serpent's head. So there had to be a continuance of the human race. And through Noah's family, it continued. It then grew from Noah to Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph to Egypt, right? To Pharaoh, to the Jews, multiplying in number, being in captivity. Moses gets them across the Red Sea. God, through Moses, keeps them safe for 40 years. Then, under Joshua, they cross another body of water, the Jordan River, into what? The promised land. And there, for 450 years, God said, you trust me, I'll defeat your enemies. And God was faithful to that. As they trusted, he defeated. You go through the period of the judges. You go through the period of the kings. Saul, David, Solomon. And God is faithful all the way through. The seed is passing one generation to the other until eventually the seed will be Messiah. And God is taking care of his people as they trust him. Saul, David, and Solomon, they're rebellious though. The 12 tribes of Israel, they split from one kingdom into two. Ten tribes in the north, two in the south. And that brings us to a very faithful man named Isaiah, who as a prophet of God for 50 years spoke God's will. God's promises, and at points, God's consequences, God's judgment for their waywardness when they didn't trust him. Isaiah was a faithful guy. Never easy to be a prophet of God, especially when God's people aren't being faithful to him. At the time, 700 years before Jesus Christ, when Isaiah was prophesying for God, he basically was the mouthpiece to God's people for God. The Assyrian Empire was the empire du jour. They were in charge of everything. We often go to Isaiah chapter 9 when we come to this time of year, Christmas time, because he prophesies about that seed. He prophesies about the Messiah. And so Isaiah is very much a Christmas book, if you will. But as I've argued before, all of the Bible is a Christmas book because it points to the Messiah, who is God's provision. Now, that Assyrian empire had 180,000, just a small percentage of its soldiers, 180,000 soldiers, as Isaiah is prophesying what we read in chapter 9. There's 180,000 Assyrian trained soldiers at the ready surrounding the walls of Jerusalem. So what does God have to say to the Assyrians at that point in time? Well, It appears they don't have a snowball's chance and you know where, but this is what God says through Isaiah. The people who walk in darkness, and they had, they'll see a great light. Light's great. We love light, God. Bring it on. Yeah, well, you'll see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Oh, great. God's going to rescue us from the Assyrians. Verse 3, you will enlarge the nation of Israel. Good, we need it because there's 180,000 outside our doors. And his people will rejoice wonderful. You mean added to light, they'll be rejoicing. I'd love to rejoice. I love joy. They'll rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. Oh, this sounds good. Read on. Speak on, Isaiah. Well, for you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod. I mean, we'll get out from underneath the Assyrians? Sure sounds like it, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. 
oh, I know that story. God to the rescue again. This is great. Verse 5, the boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They'll be fuel for the fire. So that means we're going to beat the Assyrians. We're going to take all of their boots off, put them in a big pile, and make a bonfire. This is looking great. There's light. There's joy. There's freedom from oppression. And there's peace after we beat them up. This is wonderful. That's great news. Okay, so how's it going to happen? Isaiah, God's telling us through you that this is the result, but how is it all going to happen? Is lightning going to strike outside the walls of Jerusalem? What's going to happen? I said, slow down, I'll tell you. Here's what God says, verse 6, for a child will be born to us. I say, what? A child, yeah, a baby, a little baby. Okay, what else? Well, the government's going to rest on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord's, of Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Oh, but what about the 180 soldiers outside the walls? Oh, don't worry, a baby. A baby is going to be born. Oh, yeah, that helps. Could you see Isaiah take this baby and hold it up over the walls of Jerusalem? We're going to get you! <laughs> and you can see all 180,000 Assyrians just shaking their boots. Oh, it's a baby, it's a baby. Yeah, we're going to get you. See what God's done for us? We got a baby. <laughs> well, it's no ordinary child, right? The child is God himself. God in human flesh and bone, but God Himself, He's born, as it says, from human parentage, but He's given to mankind from God. Just by way of a cultural understanding here, back in that day, if there was a king, there would always be in our parlance a tagline to the king's rule, that is to say, what the king was best known for, right? Conqueror of the such and such a peninsula or such and such a sea, right? So there's this tagline to any king's rule some 700 years before Jesus Christ, much like we would in our day have a tagline to a political platform, right? Remember FDR? What was his in 1932? It was the New Deal, right? In the 50s and 60s, it was civil rights. Lyndon Johnson was the war on poverty. Ronald Reagan was trickle-down what? Come on. That's not that far back. You know your history. Reagan was what? Trickle-down Economics, right. If you go back to the 19th century, James K. Polk, his was manifest destiny. God has called us not just to be in America on the eastern seaboard. It's our manifest destiny given by God that we would control coast to coast, east coast all the way to the west coast. That's our manifest destiny. And that's what he ran on. And what's President-elect Trump, what's he running on? Like him or not, what's he running on? Make America what? Good, you're paying attention. Well... Every king had a tagline. Any king, every king had some reputation. What was the reputation of this baby going to be? Going to be, according to the prophet. He would be wonderful counselor. Prince of peace, mighty God, everlasting father. Wow, there's some taglines for you. But still, it's a baby. And there's 180,000 Assyrians around Jerusalem at the time of the prophecy. What consolation is that? What hope is there in that? Well, it's no ordinary child. It's God in the flesh. This is the seed, the offspring promised by God back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, the one who will someday crush the head of Satan. In verse 7, it says, His government and His peace will never end. Fairness and justice will roll from His throne. And the passionate commitment, the commitment of God. Remember, for reasons we will not ever entirely understand, what is of the nature of God? What's of the nature of God is a refusal, a refusal to cast aside His plan or cast aside the people of His plan. So what is going to make sure? Who is going to make sure that the reign of this baby will someday come to the place where the head of the enemy is crushed. It's the commitment. It's the commitment of Yahweh 
that will ensure that it happens. And while even at this time there was no baby that was born, Jesus was still 700 years in the future. God would have, because He promised to, He would have allowed the Israelites to conquer the Assyrians that day had they trusted Him. Instead, they chose not to, and they suffered slavery as a consequence. But that child was still going to come. He was going to come. Love came down at Christmas in Jesus Christ, and peace, therefore, can be achieved between God and man. So this is the grand story, and you know it well. It's the grand story of God and mankind. He has a plan, not a whim, a deliberate plan. He creates man, then man creates a problem. Is it man's problem? Yes, but because God is a loving God and is determined to be with the people He created, you could argue the real problem is God's. How do I get my people back? And how does He do that? Through the Christ child, the baby who is the provision for all that's gone wrong. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. God has provided a way back for us. But what of your individual life? You'll notice that your life, your individual life, is a story as well, just like mine with my grandparents in Norway and baseball and Brookwoods and my mom and my dad and hitchhiking and all the rest. Somehow it ends up and there's a me. You have an individual story as well. Have you ever thought that your individual story follows the same pattern as God's grand story? God has a plan for you because you, like me, like Adam, like Eve, are wayward. We create some problems for God in that grand plan. But then what does God do for you individually? The same thing He does for you generically, generally. He's the provision. He's the provision. Jesus is your provider. He's your rescuer. Ransom Heart Ministries, uh, in the brief article, the author writes this. Life doesn't come to us like a math problem. It comes to us the way a story does, scene by scene. You wake up, well, what will happen next? You don't get to know. You have to enter into the story. You have to take the journey as it comes. The sun might be shining. There might be a tornado outside. Your friends might call and invite you to go sailing. You might lose your job. Life unfolds like a drama. Each day has a beginning and an end. There are all sorts of characters, all sorts of settings. A year goes by like a chapter from a novel. Sometimes it seems like a tragedy, sometimes like a comedy. Most of it feels like a soap opera. Whatever happens, though, it's a story through and through. Yours is. Mine is. Well, what's your story been like of late? What season or what chapter, what part of a particular chapter are you in at this time of year? Are there chapters or scenes in your chapters of this current time that you'd love to just tear from the pages of that storybook? Understand this. The pattern we see in God's grand story, plan, problem, provision, is the same pattern for your individual life. It's the same pattern. And there's still that same provider. He knows the problems. He knows the struggles. And He cares. And you can rest assured that if the grand problem, if He's faithful there, why would He then be unfaithful in your individual problem? In the grand plan and in the individual plan, it's the same God. The same God that can't cast away His people, gen generally speaking, can't cast you away, specifically speaking. I'd like to invite up a good friend of mine. His name is Jay, Jay Craig. Why don't you welcome him on up? Jay, thanks for being here, brother. Come on over. Do you feel like standing or sitting? Uh, we'll try sitting. You want to try sitting? All right, let's do that. All right, Jay, have a seat, my friend. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dennis. Well, as I mentioned, Jay's a, a good friend of mine, and I asked him to come just to share a little bit of his life with us this morning. Thanks for being here, brother. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Maybe just share just a, a little bit about your family and, and uh, how it is that you came to Mission Hills Church. boy Lorenzo who is 
12, and Ellie, who is 10, and, and they're such a blessing mm -hmm. in going through what I'm going through. And uh, with Mission Hills Church, I know God opened the door for us to come here and stuff, because mm -hmm. just while I was going to church in Santa Ana, we were, and we were just looking for a church that was close to us. So, mm -hmm. so we found it on the internet. All right. We love the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hey, maybe if, if you don't mind, share a little bit about the personal struggles that, that you and your family are going through right now. Well, in, of all days, April 1st of 2014, um, our lives changed. I was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and I have two to five years, and April 1st will be, you know, end of my third year. It's a struggle. It's, it's not easy. Jay, what, if you don't mind, um, what might be some of the, the specific points of discouragement for you in the middle of your ALS and how that's impacted you? What, what's been particularly difficult? What's difficult is not to be able to physically interact. My arms are just, they're not useful anymore. I can't do anything around the house. And, you know, I retired from my job after 34 years. Um, I can't interact with the kids in a way I do. having to take everything out. She's having to bathe me and, and dress me and, you know, but I mean, God has put us together and I'm just so thankful. Those mm. are my struggles with this. Mm. And Jay, what, um, what in particular has been meaningful for you in terms of maybe the experiences that you've had with Jesus that maybe are directly related to having ALS? How, how has Jesus shown up and been faithful? My walk that I have with the Lord now, I wouldn't change for anything. You know, people have asked, well, are people praying for healing? And I said, well, if God wants to heal me, he'll heal me. I just pray that his will be done in my life. Mm -hmm. And what I want to be also is I just want, I don't want people feeling sorry for me or anything like that. I just want to be an encouragement to others, no matter what we're going through. I mean, I know there's people out here, brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. that are going through stuff. And uh, I want to be there for you. You know, we're all going to meet this. I just have an idea how mine's going to happen and stuff, mm. you know. But, I mean, the joy in my walk, I wouldn't change for anything. So I, I kind of count it as a blessing with what's happening, mm. you know. And, and that's about it. So Jesus has been your provision. My provision yeah. is just to remember that this life is but preparation for eternity. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for Jay, all right? Heavenly Father, we... Uh, we're humbled um, in Jay's presence because uh, we just get a glimpse of some of what he's experiencing and we wonder, goodness, how would we respond? But thank you, Lord, for the witness of his life, the testament of his life to your provision and your closeness. God, just uh, hearing Jay say earlier that he, he's not striving anymore. He's replaced his striving with trusting, his replaced his desire to fix everything with just a desire to be close to you. And God, thank you for Jay's testimony. Thank you for the faith that he has that can remind us that whatever we're dealing with, God, we need to lean in toward you and trust as well. So encourage Jay and Janine and Lorenzo and Ellie. God, as their family has made huge adjustments in the last two and a half years and those adjustments aren't done. There's more to happen. May these days be sweet and may this Christmas be particularly meaningful to the children, to Jay, to Janine. Thank you, Father, that church should be and can be and needs to be here, a place where we can just unravel and be ourselves in the middle of the pain we experience and find encouragement from each other. And we thank you that this morning we can find encouragement from Jay. 
It's in Christ's name we give you thanks for him and for our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's thank Jay for being here. Thank you, Jay. Well, Christmas reminds us, please keep this in mind. Christmas reminds us that since God was able to fix, if you will, to solve, to resolve man's greatest problem, then God has every intention and is fully capable of being the provision for your individual problems. Right? If he can resolve this problem, he can resolve the individual ones, ALS or anything else. If the grand story of mankind is that love came down in Jesus, then that same Jesus with that same love is willing to come to me in my personal pain and you in your personal pain and trouble as well. So then, what are the troubles you're facing today? What is staring at you? What are you staring at? A fractured? or a broken marriage, a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter, an illness, maybe like Jay's, maybe different, a legal dilemma, debt, unemployment, depression, doubt, loneliness. What is staring at you today? Now, with some challenges, there are steps that God's Word tells us in wisdom, take these steps. But with others and with many challenges, we have no control in the matter whatsoever. And the only real step to take is a step like Jay's, to lean in God's direction, to learn to trust Him more in a circumstance that's beyond your control, believing that you don't need to strive, rather you need to rest in His goodness, to believe He's always at work. John Ortberg, in his book, Don't Waste a Crisis, says this, God isn't at work producing the circumstances I want. God is at work in bad circumstances producing the me He wants. Christmas reminds us that God will lift us out of this fallen world someday and that in the meantime, He can be trusted to use our pain to transform us into greater lovers of God, into people who trust God just like Jesus trusts God. And you don't think Jesus had to trust Him? Wow. So if you don't believe me, believe the Bible, believe the testimony of Job, believe the testimony of Moses, believe the testimony of David or Jesus' parents, the testimony of Joseph and Mary. Believe them or believe Jay because each of them have had trials larger than mine and each of them have a consistent story and that is of a consistent Savior. Praise the Lord. If God was able to solve man's biggest problem, then he is also the solution to all lesser problems as well. Amen? Amen? And that's why we celebrate Jesus. We celebrate not only His birth, His life, but His death and His resurrection as well. And so as our ushers come forward and we move into a time of, again, celebrating Jesus through the Lord's table, remember, remember the words of Jesus on that Thursday evening, the Last Supper with His disciples when He said, this is my body. It's been given for you. It'll be broken for you. And he handed them the bread. They partook of the bread, and after taking the bread, in like fashion, Jesus then took what was more than likely a wooden goblet, a goblet of wine, and he held it up before them, and he said, the content of this goblet symbolizes the new agreement between God the Father and you. That is, the shedding of my blood that will take away, not cover, not hide, not put under the rug, but will take away all of your sin. So as you drink and as you eat, remember my death until I come again. And oh, by the way, I am coming again. In the moment